I am Jennifer Joy Madden. I live in the Washington DC area. I'm a specialist in the area of uh, digital wellness and I'm glad you're with me today. And I'm sure everyone is, is, is calling in and stopping in from all over the place. Even if it's nine o'clock AM where you are, you've already had quite a day. So I thought that we could start with an exercise that would bring us all together. We are here in a physical form, but what we want to do is also be here mentally, try to let go of the things that we've been thinking about today so we can be here now. So I thought we could try a breathing exercise just to get us started. And it has intention to it. So it would be that we're going to breathe in with gratitude. And when I say gratitude, I mean that we made it through. We made it through the pandemic. I know some hearts are broken on this call because we lost somebody that we loved, but here we are, we made it. And so it's okay to be grateful for that. And we'll do that today. So when we breathe in, we're gonna breathe in with gratitude. And when we breathe out, we're gonna breathe out with hope. Hope, hope for the next phase, what, what's happening. Um, when we ease out of this, what has been a lockdown position. So I would just encourage everyone to be still, put your feet flat on the floor, supported or supported by a chair, and then make sure your arms are resting and relaxed and your hands are relaxed. And now we're just gonna do three breaths slowly and we're going to be breathing in with gratitude and out with hope. So let's close our eyes and start now. Breathe in with gratitude, out with hope. In with gratitude, out with hope. In with gratitude, out with hope. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for joining me on that. And I will go ahead and share my screen now so we can get going with the actual program. So we have an intention for today, and that is to be talking about you and yours. You and your people, are, that's who we're gonna be focusing on today. And we're gonna be looking forward. We're gonna have a little bit in the rear view, but mostly looking ahead because we're gonna be learning from what, what we went through. Uh, we are going to stick to one hour and we are going to have questions and answers, but those will be later on. And if you would, please, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. The Q&A is where we're going to see them. Uh, so let me tell you uh, what we need to live by are these words by Ralph Waldo Emerson. As you may know, he was an American philosopher, poet, and essayist. And he said, make the most of yourself because that is all there is to you. And I had this saying hanging up on our fridge the whole time my kids were growing up. And I just wanted them to know that each and every one of them was special and unique and worthy of caring for and loving and taking care of. And who takes care of you the best? Yourself, because you know yourself the best. And so even though we have families and spouses and loved ones and coworkers, it starts with being caring of ourselves. So today, those are the words we're gonna live by is make the most of yourself for that is all there is to you. So let me tell you who I am. I call myself a cheerleader for humanity. I uh, really enjoy technology, but I feel that humans are amazing and awesome with uh, spectacular assets like your sense of intuition and all the other of the five senses, of course, your sense of compassion, your sense of humor and all those things. And so, you know, right on for you as a human. I am a certified digital wellness instructor certified by the Digital Wellness Institute, who is happens to be sponsoring Digital Wellness Day today. And I'm an adjunct professor of broadcast and digital media for Syracuse University. I'm an author and a health journalist. I worked at ABC News, PBS, the Discovery Channel, places like that, dispensing pretty much mostly health news. 
right? Go Qs. And I am the founder of DurableHuman.com. Now, uh, that Durable Human was formed, I formed it in 2009 after noodling over what was happening <laughs> after the smartphones came on scene. Because I'm like, wow, these are amazing. And they're really, they're really changing us um, intrinsically the way that we live our lives. And I was actually kind of worried about um, what was happening with these guys. These are my three wonderful practicing durable human children. And they, um, I knew that we were all being affected. I knew we were being affected up by how we treated each other and, and how we interacted. So I wanna show you them. That's Brian on the left, Shannon in the middle, Riley on the right. And here's a new person in our family. And that would be baby Cooper. So I had to show you him today. Um, so anyway, Brian B. Madden is here with me. He's the middle child, and he's going to be watching the q and I'll just tell you a little bit about him. He's an artist and an industrial designer. He has worked for Nike, Target, and right there he's holding his uh, the award that they use to give the 99 Club winners, like Patrick Mahomes, um, uh, when they win the top um top places in the Madden NFL 99 club. So Brian is becoming a specialist in marble art. And thank you for the congratulations for little Cooper. Uh, anyway, let's see. Brian taught me about design. I didn't know anything about design. And he was the one who went to Rochester Institute of Technology and got his degree in industrial design. And it was all about design. And I fell in love with design right from the very first day that he was oriented because it said design is all around us. And it is. If you look around you, everything around you is designed. And guess what? We're all designers because we can design um, aspects of our lives. Design, Bruce Archer really really nailed it in 1973. Uh, he was a, a mechanical engineer at the British Royal Academy of Arts. And he said, design is the area of human experience, skill and knowledge, which is concerned with man's ability to mold his environment to suit his material and spiritual needs. So I was so enthused by design. I wrote a whole book about it and it's about self-design. And this is my definition from the book. Design tends to your body and soul. So to design your own life is to tend to your body and soul, to set up your life so you have a maximum uh, use of all your wonderful assets uh, uh, as a human being. Now, you noticed in the materials for this that I was referring to the next normal, and you might be wondering why next normal? Well, you've also heard the term new normal, and I have to say that it makes me nervous because it makes me not know what's going to be in the future, and that makes me anxious because I won't know anything and it'll all be new. So I feel that the next normal might be a term that could be more palatable to our mental health in terms of bringing things from the past that we want to keep from the pandemic, maybe that went well, and things from before into the future. And so we have the next normal. Now, I do want to acknowledge that the pandemic has been different for everyone and that some of us have had a, a horrible, sorrowful experience and to lose loved ones suddenly or whether they lingered, um, to lose jobs, to lose our livelihood, to lose our careers. And so it's been horribly deep um, and overwhelming for some people in that way. But everyone has experienced grief and loss and fear. So none of us has, has go, have gone through this unscathed. So I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, and to, to say that we all have to be gentle with each other and understanding of what we went through. But I believe there are better days ahead. There have to be, because I'm a big proponent of the outdoors and we're gonna be able to get out much more often now. Now I'm going to be presenting some findings and I wanted to say I'm not making this up because I'm going to make some statements about how it went during the pandemic for families and individuals, but it's based on scientific evidence from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the US CDC, Boston Children's Digital Wellness Lab, 
the American Optometric Association and expert panels from children and screens. So I am a health journalist and so I do like to refer to these things and I will be telling you all about them. So this is what the survey showed. We did hunker down. We tried to create a safe place for our families we gave love as best we could, and we found activities that could help the kids feel better, uh, maybe trying to maintain some sort of a routine. And this is what the American Academy of Pediatrics said. Many families set out to have a safe and loving home. And so that's the case. So uh, for many fortunate families, uh, they pulled together. But it was really hard, as you know, and you can remember, especially during the full lockdown period. And it was scary. And probably a lot of you here on the chat, maybe this was just your situation. You're trying to just keep life and limb together and figure out what's going on. You have to check online and do whatever you need to there. And the kids are running around. You don't want to park them in front of a screen necessarily. And they're just being kids. And oh my gosh, overwhelming situation. The Digital Wellness Lab uh, went through all the comments that it's uh, 1,500 families that they interviewed in a survey in March of 2021 uh, with kids ages 5 to 17. These are the, the, the word cloud of positive words from their surveys. So you could see them there. Family, how about that? Friends, time, good, communicate, connected. I think we saw that. So the reason I wanted you guys to try to put some words in the chat was to see how they would line up with what we have here. And we definitely saw a connected word. Then these are the more negative ones. Internet, time, bad, media, pain, eyes, eyesight, slow, and the family again. So it's interesting, the Venn diagram has family in it. Uh, we did the best we could, all jammed together, people kind of in shock because they may not, they couldn't return to their offices. So suddenly they're thrown at home. They may have lost their job completely. And then the kids, wow, what a flip directly to online learning for those that had internet connections, scrambling to get Wi-Fi and internet connections. And then once you get one, you're on it, they're on it for hours. Now I have been, I will confess that I have been in the camp of, of, of limiting screen time for kids, not necessarily because of the technology part, because, but because it, they don't learn other stuff when they're always involved with the screen. But I saw all of us having to, to admit that it was necessary if the kids were going to ingest any teaching uh, from their school system that they had no choice but to get on there. And it was just an amazing turnabout. And this is one of the things, maybe you saw in the negative cloud that it said pain, eyes, eyesight. And so that's, that's happened. Now, some of us felt they knew what digital eye strain was before the pandemic, but everybody knew what it was by the time the pandemic had been here for several months. And that's including the kids. So the American Optometric Association has a whole bunch of people around the country that are eye care professionals. These are folks that uh, use that are, you know, you get your glasses and there's somebody there, a professional wants to examine your eyes before you get your glasses. They're seeing kids coming in at an alarming rate with eye strain, headaches, and conditions such as dry eye. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's that bad, but it's a very serious condition. It usually doesn't happen to a child. It's very hard to get rid of. So they, kids are experiencing physical eye conditions that they didn't have before. So we're gonna talk about this a little bit later. So I think that as we leave the pandemic, when all we ever heard was the word resilient, oh, children are so resilient and everybody's being so resilient and it's great. And I, resilient is a wonderful state to be in. 
But I think that it's time as we move forward that we have to be more than resilient. If if you see the, the grass here, we see it's blowing over to the side and we hope it's gonna straighten back up again, but it keeps blowing over. So I say to be durable. This is a giant sequoia. It is thousands of years old and it has experienced numerous wildfires, but yet it's still there. And in fact, a little small fact about giant sequoias, the wildfires cleans out all the underbrush and then the seeds fall off of the sequoia and they grow out of the rubble of the fire. So the sequoia is really an amazing, amazing plant. But to be durable is to be um, withstand bumps in the road. So with resilient, you have this huge accident and you're knocked over and you get back up. But to be durable is to go along the road and get over the bumps without falling out the window or falling over to figure out a way to compensate as you're uh, experiencing life's challenges. Durable means to be dependable and effective. If you have eyesight, let's keep it effective. Let's, let's work to maintain our vision. And durable means basically built to last in your mind, your body, and your relationships. And something interesting about the pandemic, the American Academy of Pediatrics has stated that there were positive childhood experiences in the pandemic. You've heard about adverse childhood events. Those are things that happen to a child that are very traumatic. And then when they grow up, their physical health is affected and their mental health a lot of times. Well, guess what? In the pandemic, they're talking about there were positive childhood experiences that actually were good for the brain. Here's their quote the potential for brain building resilience amid catastrophe. Interestingly enough, in the Durable Human Manifesto, I called out durability uh, growing out of catastrophe. And that when we are forced from the familiar, we need to compensate. We might have to call on our inner resources. It makes us stronger and more durable. In my 2013 book, I said, just ask anyone who had to contend with the likes of Sandy or Katrina. I think that we went through our own Sandy or Katrina with COVID. We were, we were stunned and shaken to the bone and that builds durability. So, you know, probably we all became more durable in, in different ways during the pandemic. And kids, this is the way they see us. They see us as this giant sequoia. I know it's a big responsibility to know that your kids see you this way, but that's why it behooves us, behooves us parents to do what we can to be as durable as possible so we don't fall apart for them. And I say we can all do something to be more durable. Like it's the, like the game of golf. The, no one is ever a perfect golfer, but people who do golf are practicing their whole lives and they get better and better. You'll see the, the, the golfers that are the best golfers are those who have practiced and have some talent, but they all need to practice. And so what we need to do in order to be durable is to, to build habits in support of our wellness and our durability. So a habit is a usual manner of behaving and it's acquired by doing it over and over again and it becomes nearly involuntary, or what I like to say, a no-brainer. So when you build a habit, it becomes a no-brainer. And so that's what we want to do with our wellness around screens and not around screens, but definitely around our loved ones and around ourselves. Because we're trying to do this. We're trying to stay in balance with body, mind, and spirit. And also to keep these in balance. This is a trifecta of wellness and durability. On the left, we have nutrition, which is what you take in. What is your fuel? How do you fuel your body? Do you fuel it with what it needs? On the right is exercise, which is physical activity or movement. We are wonderful human animals, and all animals need to move in order to be healthy. And so that's a very important part of staying in balance with our wellness. And then sleep really does underlie it all. And we can't survive without sleep. So sleep is also there. But, oh, 
ouch, there's the pandemic. And boy, it threw a monkey wrench into our trying to stay balanced and perfectly, you know, all of everything just great with our nutrition and exercise. And it was, ah! So that's kind of how, how it was for us. And we're still coming out of it, as you know. So I have distilled nine wellness habits for the next normal that I believe are going to support families in their transition to what's happening next. Uh, kids are going to be going back to in-person activities and, and adults may be going back to their jobs in person and it's not going to be the same. It's going to be different. So we have to have this underlying state of solidity of being, uh, being attached, like solid as a family, and then stable in our minds and bodies and being strong and capable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the habits, but I've got to put, look through the lens of what was found in these surveys of the pediatrics and the digital wellness lab. And what was found is there was a, even part of the pandemic 20, I think that's what it is, too many calories consumed without thinking about it. So because there was a lot of screen use mixed in with everything else, like during lunch, after dinner, during dinner, you know, too many calories consumed simply because of not paying attention to what we're eating. Folks uh, and encountered real difficulties uh, in terms of losing their livelihood and uh, their economics changed drastically in the family. They had to shop differently if they could shop. Some people had to uh, rely on the kindness of others and they would get a box of foods that they could use for the week, but usually those weren't crammed with things like fruits and vegetables. So people tended to buy the least expensive food, which are usually high in calories, high in carbohydrates and are processed. So those aren't real good for our, our body nutrition. And there are kind of no limits. Oh, gosh, the first few weeks of the pandemic, um, certain writers, influential writers in certain in newspapers were saying, don't worry about screen time, just forget about it. No limits started happening and it, things got kind of out of control. And that of course affected people's eating habits because you eat for dinner and then you eat all night long having snacks. So it's always snack time. So one of the first habit I'm going to explain is share family meals. Uh, I will say that these habits are very simple. I mean, you may already be doing them, but it might be a matter of consistency. This is better weight control. Obviously, if kitchen's closed after dinner, they have dinner and then that's it. So you can, you know, maintain better uh, control of the intake of food by having meals where you sit down and eat. Uh, turn taking. So we're getting to the social side here of sharing family meals. Kids have been getting out of practice of being with other people during the pandemic. They are interrupting each other. They're forgetting how to be sociable. At the family meal, your family can learn how to be sociable again. And they could take turns waiting for the other person to stop speaking before they speak. And manners has to do with communication. So at family meals, we can, um, kids, can learn how to have a give and take of a conversation. And that's that's very important for them to be able to get back to in-person relationships with people outside of their home. And the important thing for parents in sharing family meals is that you can have daily observation. You can have eyes on your child every day and you can watch for subtle signs that their well-being might be changing. Something's bothering them. So later on in the day, you might go out, go up and ask them what's wrong. If you don't look at them and you don't see them on a daily basis, you might miss it. That problem could become really large and overwhelming and be damaging to your child. So it's great to have a daily look at your child. Now, associated with that would be no devices at meals. That is a basket from my uh, pantry and the uncles were coming to meet Cooper for the first time and we were gathered round. It was lovely to be together 
gathered around the dinner table before we went to over to see him. And I noticed everybody was on their phone. So I went into the, in the pantry. I got this basket. I put it on the counter, put it down. And each one of them got up one by one. I didn't say a word. I didn't even look at them. And they put their phones into the basket. That, my friends, is a habit. And it's really good to get the attention stealers away from the kitchen table in a basket or other container uh, and gives a chance for the family to talk to each other, to listen, and to see, to really see and not have continuous partial attention, which is the technical term for when you're holding your phone and talking to somebody and keep looking down and up at their face. And uh, that's not a good example for our kids. And it's uh, it, it kind of gives the message that we don't really want to pay much attention to them. And that's, they don't like that. That um, makes the child feel very insecure. Again, when your phone is in the basket and it's out of reach, silenced and out of reach, you can keep an eye on your kids closely and you don't miss anything to be able to help them if you sense that they're having a problem and asking them what's wrong. Sometimes it's just as simple as that. So here we go with another finding. Um, too much sitting around led to slower metabolism. Sitting is called being sedentary and it means that you don't uh, move around so you don't burn calories and uh, there's a quote from someone who said the, the metabolism goes as dead as a dead horse or something like that. It's like everything just slows down. You can imagine that that has effects on your physical health, uh, short term and long term. There's an opportunity cost for too much sitting around. There are some benefits from playing video games, for instance, but if they're done hour after hour after hour, it pushes away time for this child to, to, to uh, learn any other skills for life, for being interdependent and dependent when they, independent when they grow up. So we want to give them time to learn how to cook, play the piano, sew on a button, sand, furniture, <laughs> just whatever. Uh, and then it also leads to listless spirit and languishing if there's too much sitting around. And you may have been hearing this word languishing lately, which is, kind of being neither here nor there. I'm not really bummed out, but I'm not excited about anything. I don't have much motivation. I'm just kind of here. That's languishing. That's too much sitting around and it leads to listlessness in kids. So simple, get up and move. Get up and move once an hour through the day, especially when you're on a screen. Because if you get into that habit, your body is going to have a regular recharge every hour. So you get your metabolism running. Uh, this little guy, I saw this online. I had to, had to show you some, you know, industrious parent did the hopscotch on a floor with, with painter's tape. And this kid is just loving it. Got him off the couch. It gives you energy and creativity. Larry Rosen wrote the book, Eye Disorder. And he discovered that after about an hour or two, the brain goes into a state of log jam. You can't take any more information in. Maybe you've noticed that. You've been sitting at your desk for an hour or two and I can't, I, I, I can't do anything. I'm, I'm trying to do something I can't. Well, your, your mind is in a state of log jam. It needs a break. To get up and move once an hour is to break up the log jam. When I do it, uh, I will do 60 jumping jacks every hour and I come back to my desk and for some reason, it's miraculous, if I had been stuck for a word or something I wanted to, to write, I'd get it. It would be there. It's like the log jam had been broken. And so that's the, the reason to get up and move. It, and it actually increases your creativity, which increase, increases your productivity, which I write about in How to Be a Durable Human, that if you know that by taking a break, the mental log jam ends and you come back to your desk and then you're productive. You can actually get more done over a day's time and less time because you're not sitting there hitting your head against the wall, trying to wait for the right, right word to come. And also disease prevention. This is pretty serious. Uh, people that are sedentary grow up to have in not too many years because a lot of children are developing type two diabetes, heart disease, and several forms of cancer, to name a few, 
diseases that occur from not moving. Playing outside and getting that movement outside is even better uh, because there are so many benefits to being in nature for human animals, especially children. Richard Louvre wrote the book, Last Child in the Woods, which I recommend that you all read. And he talks about nature deficit disorder, which is what happens is an ennui that takes over kids when they haven't been outside because they wilt like flowers without water if they aren't outside for a while. And that was really hard for families this year because they didn't get that. The kids couldn't be out in nature as much. So playing outside is, is very important for, for their mental health for that reason. We all are supposed to get an hour of physical exercise. Uh, they're supposed to get an hour of physical exercise a day and we are supposed to get a half hour. So when they're playing outside, they're actually fulfilling their requirement for exercise. So it's an easy way to combine exercise with having fun. Um, it also increases their strength and coordination. In the last few decades, kids' strength, their core strength has been dropping off precipitously. So when they play outside, they can build up their core strength and their coordination. Coordination, of course, is, is important for doing sports, but just playing tennis with your friend is also, you need to be coordinated. This child hanging on the swing is building her core strength. So that's uh, a really, but she doesn't know that. She doesn't realize that nobody told her to do it. She's just playing. That's the beautiful thing about playing. And also when kids get outside, they aren't under anybody's thumb and they don't have to take orders from any school and they're just outside playing and kids get into an imaginative and creative state when they're in that situation. And so it, it brings joy, it brings freedom, it brings all those things for them to be able to play outside in a safe place. You can go to a park and, and they can play there. Um, and sometime there's, we're gonna have the freedom to be able to, sh to switch off again and take our kids to the park. And um, you know, one day your neighbor can take them and one day you can. And again, playing outside, getting that hour of exercise is, is important for disease prevention and for eye care, as we're going to learn in a few minutes. Disrupted sleep. This is uh, happening rampantly to different age groups across the age spectrum. And uh, there's less retention of information because when we're sleeping, our brain goes through a process of kind of it's like putting information into file drawers. And if it's interrupted during the night, the files never make it into the file drawers and the information is not there the next day. It, honest to goodness, leads to a poorer memory when you're you know, on the phone in the middle of the night. More tired during the day. This is not why words. These are words from teenagers and middle schoolers. If they're on their phones in the middle of the night, they're more tired during the day. They admit it. And we do have a shorter lifespan if we don't watch our sleep hygiene because of the way it affects our bodies. Um, we have telomeres in our cells. They're kind of like pencil erasers. Every day we live, they're, they're shaved off a little bit. Well, when you don't sleep well, it's shaved off even more. And that means when the pencil eraser's gone off the pencil, you know, that's the end of our lives. So why, why shorten the pencil? I don't know. So that's the thing to talk to your kids about. Um, it's kind of like, look, this isn't about your phone. This isn't about your technology. This is about you being the best you can be. This is about you and your success and being a good friend the next day, you know, not bombing out on the test, that sort of stuff. So just kind of flip it around and make it about them and not about the phone. So there we go with turn off screens. Screens um, emit blue light. The sun also emits blue light. It's not really a coincidence that the screen causes an alert response in us. It disrupts our ability to fall asleep. And so it's a good idea to turn off screens an hour or two before bedtime so you can, um, your body can relax and go to sleep. Uh, it stops the blue light, it gives you time to think and read. So we ingest information all day. This gives all of us time to actually uh, digest the information. Kids especially need time to think, to sort things out, make sense of life, 
develop a moral compass, sense of right and wrong. So this is their time. But as a parent, it's one of those habits that you need to enforce. And yes, they use, they'll use uh, their imagination in this time period and perhaps read, which we're gonna talk about in just a minute. Um, this is their time also to connect with family. Mom and dad hopefully are off their phones and their, their tablets for the day. They're, get, they're winding down. This is the time that's gonna be really fun, like the old days when you used to read a book together. Why not do it again? We all need reassurance. We all need love right now. So this hour or two before bedtime is the perfect time for them to know that you love them. And so sleeping screen free, like getting the, the phones away from the table is to sleep screen free. Uh, children, teenagers, phones are charged out of the room, in the hallway, in your bathroom, in the kitchen. Uh, so they can be their maximum self tomorrow. Uh, there was, when the screens are removed, there's no beeps, light, or temptation to disrupt sleep. And what's really important is they're learning the skill of separating them, their, themselves from their phones. You know that teenagers and middle schoolers like to hold their phones all the time, it, it, but they aren't a part of their body. And they need to know that, that they can exist without their phones. So if this is the only reason to have them charge their phone in the hallway, it's so that they know that who they are. They know that they can exist without their phone and they can think and they can fall asleep and they can be without their phone. And of course, memory consolidation, it's to be a better student uh, is to sleep without your screen. Adults, I uh, know that you want them there for safety, but I still would suggest turning them off, putting them out of reach and out of sight. Not, I'm sorry, not turning them off, turning uh, most notifications off, just your emergency ones, and then put them out of reach and out of sight. And that's going to help you to sleep better too. Okay, um, this is another habit, take a tech-free day. This happens to be a screen-free week. Um, I don't challenge you too hard to take a tech-free day once a month. Once a month, just to have that attachment happen and reassurance that you're still there and you're still a family and to have carefree fun no agenda. So this care, take a tech free day really shouldn't be the day of a, a lacrosse tournament because that's, there's an agenda, but carefree fun is just, you know, going, maybe exploring a park or something like that. You can go to a museum too. You're all learning together. Again, it's a free form thing when you go through a museum and they're going to be opening up soon too. Plus it's physical activity. It's sort of a, a little sneaky way for people to have physical activity, uh, together to, um, you know, to get, get away from the sedentary lifestyle of being inside. Read a book. Uh, what they found is that the kids are really, they've been multitasking this whole time. Um, they're on doing school, they're on their phone, they're all tabbing into YouTube just frenetically all day long. It has affected them. They uh, can't really sit still when they get to the classroom, kids that are going back. Now is the time to go ahead and start some habits such as this one, read a book, so they can extend their attention span and their focus. It's practice for single tasking. So when they get into the classroom, they can sit there when the teacher is talking to them. Maybe they don't have to have their device in their hands and they can pay attention. <clears throat> During the pandemic, it was revealed uh, that in the survey that parents were using books as a stress escape, it's still great as a stress escape, so even for children. There are things, they're, they're worried about going back to school. They're worried about what's gonna happen next. And so it's a, it's a nice stress escape for them. Uh, and then back to the idea of uh, use of devices being really hard on our eyes. There is this one. I had to get a cute animal in here some, somehow. So this is the, the look away habit. Oh, by the way, let's do it right now. I'm going to have us all demonstrate. Look up from the screen, look past the screen at something far away. Can you look out a window or the farthest corner of the room? It's nice if it's 20 feet away at least. And we're gonna just do this for 20 seconds. I'll count to 20 and keep looking away gently. Just look away. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 
13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, do you feel your eyes? Do you feel them? Mine feel more relaxed because I let them, I let them free. I let them look into the distance. And so if we do that every 20 minutes, we are going to keep exercising our eye muscles and uh, to preventing what they call digital eye strain or at least controlling it. And maybe you'll have fewer screen headaches. And when you look away for 20 seconds like that, it is a brain break. So there's some people looking out the window. Uh, they call that the 20-20-20 rule. Uh, most eye doctors, many eye doctors advocate this, uh, looking away every 20 minutes, at least 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And there's kind of a new theory coming out about the 20-20-22 rule, which is because um, sunshine actually causes the eyeballs to be in a more natural state, that children should be out in the sunshine more during the day and it'll keep their eyes more healthy and try to get control of this epidemic called myopia, which is sweeping the world of kids that are on screens a lot with few breaks and don't go outside. They're having the glasses, they're nearsighted, they're short-sighted. Well, the early research is showing it's possible that you can control that um, with going outside. So some people are advocating for 20 minute outdoor breaks for a total of two hours a day for children. So how do you how do you get these habits to stick? Well, you take the pledge. I have developed this thing called the Durable Family Pledge, and it has all those nine habits in it. You agree as a family to in a family meeting to to do one or more of these habits, and you pick four weeks to do them, and you sign. Everybody signs it, and they work on the habits. You can get this pledge at durablehuman.com/pledge anytime for free, so feel free to go over there and get it. And I also am making mini courses around each habit. So those are another thing. I know it seems, you can actually, there's a lot of research behind each of those small habits. And it's really a good way to get it into your mind that, um, you know, that these can, uh, these can really work for you. And I also go into how to hold a family meeting in those mini courses. Um, I have habit builder in there, which is like, like the durable pledge, but it has just the one habit that everybody agrees on. And then I have a, an audio lesson, a listen lesson about eye care and what's the difference between a school eye exam and a um, comprehensive eye examination, which everybody should have once a year starting in kindergarten to really uncover problems with eyes. And then my, my ebook you get and a resource list. Those are just some of the things that are in the mini course. You can also explore that a little more uh, at uh, this website. So now I would like to see if anybody has any questions. And Bri, I'm looking for the Q&A box in the bottom and I can't really see it. So uh, have we got some questions, Brian? We got some some questions coming in. I think um, uh, one one of them is um, when when you look forward to what you're calling the the uh, the next normal. Uh, what are some ways that that you personally are going to stay inspired uh, through the next chapter as as you start to explore the world more? Uh, me personally, well, I'm going to try to stay in touch with family members in a kind of an intimate way, which we did do on um, Zoom. That was the platform we used a lot of times, but my, my dad, my 97 year old dad has this other platform, very simplified platform that was really helpful for us to see him. But I'm going to try to do that in person. In other words, to really spend time individually with people and not be torn in all different directions and distracted. So. I'm going to work on that personally um, as a, and also trying to, trying to remember the parts of the pandemic that were, were, that I really enjoyed. I was very worried, so worried before the pandemic, we were spiraling out of control. 
Tom Friedman wrote a book, you know, thank you for being late. And it was all about how everything was spiraling out of control. It was getting too fast. Things were developing too quickly. And gosh, the pandemic really knocked that out. People were baking bread and they're, you know, they had, you know, they're watching Netflix, but they're doing, I don't know, they're just slowed down. And so that was a really, um, that was really kind of a wonderful part of it, I thought. And so um, the, that's, that's one of the, one of the things about the pandemic that I think we should bring into the next normal. Uh, anybody? And there is a, there is another question that came in. Uh -huh. um, it's from uh, Mary Lee Pierce. Mm -hmm. uh, how about doing a school board presentation or county council of PTAs? Such good advice for everyone. <laughs> Maybe that's more of a more of a comment. But uh, yeah, do you have any plans for for this uh, this work moving forward? Yes, I think that's a good idea. Um, certain states. I want to tell everybody who's in all different states and different countries that that the, the countries and the states are starting to wake up to the fact that we need some guidance. Um, around the way technology is being used. I mean, in this presentation, we've talked about physical effects. We've talked about mental effects. We've talked about the opportunity cost for children. In my own state of Virginia, I was instrumental and happy to uh, pass a new law that is get the education department and the health department to get together. This is all it was. That's all the, the law was. Get together and make some guidelines for uh, child use of screens in the classroom. And lo and behold, the darn thing got passed. Then the, then the pandemic happened. But they chipped away at it. They, they actually chipped away at it. The uh, Virginia Departments of Health and Education chipped away at it through the pandemic, through all the craziness. And now they have draft guidelines that we, the people, commented on, and I gave them some, uh, um, my, my opinions as a citizen, and I'm sure they're going to take them and they're going to massage the, the habits and the, and I'm sorry, the, the, the guidelines, and hopefully disseminate through them the, the entire state. So I would say that I'm not the only one that has to go talk into the school board or the county council of PTAs. I would like to tell you about a group called the Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood. Brian, maybe you could really quickly look up a link to the commercial Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood. They actually have a screen in schools toolkit, and it is filled with all sorts of uh, scripts and things you can use to start approaching the school board or your county council PTAs or your local PTA with your thoughts, you know, your thoughts that, you know, yes, screens have been really helpful during the pandemic, but uh, we are concerned that we really want our child to be able to sit still and pay attention to the teacher. And we want, we think teachers are very important and we want our children to have more time with the teachers and less time with screens. So that Screens in Schools Action Kit is amazing. I mean, I'm really excited that, that Marilee brought this up because I want everybody to know about the Screens in School Action Kit because my thing is, and that's the whole thing about this book, How to Be a Durable Human, is that we are, we're designers. We're all designers. And we, and, and I also use the term tech activism because I think that we have to speak up. We can't be just tools anymore. We have, we're, they are our tools. And so we have to speak up and say when they're being overused and we feel abused. And that's why the, you know, the op optometrists were so upset about this. And, uh, and I'm happy to be able to tell people about them and what their concerns are. And that's why I wove them. And that's why I did that mini course, because it's like, this is manageable. We can do something. We don't have to just ruin our eyes. <laughs> we actually can do stuff about it. And so it's pretty simple. Uh, any other questions, Bri? There's no more questions in the Q&A, but if, if anyone feels, uh, feels like it, feel free to drop them in the chat as well. That's right. Uh, uh, is there anything, Bri, that you think I didn't cover or you have a question about? Because we, we will uh, get back to the presentation here in a second maybe a few more minutes. 
or let me make, but since you're there, let me ask you as a designer, um, <laughs> do you think that people are their own designers? Yeah, I think uh, there's, <laughs> I've had a lot of, a lot of conversations with folks who say, yeah, I'm not a creative, I'm not creative. I, I don't have a creative bone in my body, but deep down, we all have those skills. We, we can all um, be, be durable. We can all find really interesting solutions to the problems that we're faced with. So I really do believe that we all have those, those skills. You know, we, we need creativity to get through the day these days. So I'm, I'm fully supportive of people tapping into their own creativity and, and feeling that empowerment. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to give you a little shout out here, Bri. Um, for folks who read the book, I tell the story of Bri and I was talking about creativity, creativity, you know, how do we get more creativity? He's like, mom, you can't, you can't really be creative until you're curious. Curiosity leads to creativity. So in other words, that's why we have to have the freedom of mind. That's why that, that turn off screens two hours before bedtime allows their, a child's brain to be free just to be musing on life and just thinking about it. Mind wandering, I believe is a good thing and that's appropriate. And so we need to allow kids to follow their curiosity and give them opportunity to do that. I will tell you, I don't have a slide for this, but the triple crown of durability is to have skills to do things for ourselves. In other words, not, I mean, you can, mechanics, they don't even really take care of engines anymore. They're run by computers and everything else. So that a lot of the skills are being lost about, um, about uh, how, to, how to fix things. So we need to keep our skills up, you know, changing a tire, uh, sewing on a button, all those things that human beings can do with their hands and their minds. And so that's really important. So that's part of the triple crown of durability. And then the other one is to have genuine relationships. So the relationships are very shallow. They can be shallow just in texting and social media, certain types of social media where there's no face involved. I agree that, you know, it's very powerful when you're there in person or in voice with people, but um, it, that we need to have genuine relationships. And that means to be able to have those in-person relationships. And the third thing is to follow your curiosity. What I love about us humans is that we are individuals uh, we are all one of a kind, never ever to be repeated. And that's why we need to keep ourselves durable and to follow our unique philosophy, uh, curiosity. Uh, my philosophy on this is that if we don't have the freedom to follow our curiosity, we're going to become very like-minded. In other words, there won't be the baker and the butcher and the candlestick maker. Nobody's gonna know how to do anything. We're all gonna be the same, sort of programmed by what we're doing online. We will no longer have mental diversity or skill diversity. We will no longer be relevant as artificial intelligence and uh, sets up because we'll have no skills, we'll have no talents and we'll become irrelevant. And I know that's kind of heavy, but that's really how I see it that we have to maintain our mental diversity and follow our curiosity as often as we can so we can keep coming up with ideas and keep being relevant to society. So um, got a little bit deep there, but that's how I feel. So I think we can all be working on trying to grab for the triple crown of durability at all times, which is to build our skills, to build our relationships and to follow our curiosity. So uh, let's see. I am, oh, Hillary points out that boredom is the pathway to creativity. Yes, uh, that's very important that, that's another reason for turning off those screens whenever you want, but one to two hours before bedtime because it, they may not know what to do with themselves, which is gonna lead them to doing something with themselves, which is, you know, grabbing, grabbing, the book or the game or the puzzle or the toy or just talking to somebody and building up their communication skills like in the family or their attachment. So boredom leads to something, always has. In the Durable Human Manifesto, I talk about how Steve Jobs and um, particularly Steve um, Woz, Steve Wozniak, in the summer, he used to go scrounging around for telephone wire and he actually wired up an intercom between his neighbor's house and his house. So that's what 
really um, led to his intense creativity as a designer to create the Apple II computer. And, and then he teamed up, teamed up with Steve Jobs. Jobs also had that unplugged uh, upbringing because we're all in the last generation before cell phones. So they were too, that we, they grew up as children without cell phones. They were tremendously, tremendously creative because they followed their, not because, they were able to follow their curiosity, they became creative. And so I, I wonder in the book out loud, what if, would a cell phone have snuffed out Steve Wozniak's creativity? Would a video game have grabbed the attention of Steve Jobs? It didn't. And we're, uh, are we lucky that it didn't? I guess I'll leave you with that question myself. I just want to remind you that the pledge is available at any time for free. So go there and when you go to this place where the pledge is, you're going to see little snippets of the mini courses that are coming up. And if you feel like you're interested in one of them, pre-register, then I'll know you're interested in it. Maybe I'll be producing that one next because you're interested. Uh, so I'm going to, maybe the next one I'm going to do is how to hold a family meeting. Tell me in the chat if you think that would be a useful little mini course at how the heck to hold a family meeting because they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty helpful sometimes when you've gotten into a, a bind with your, in your family to be able to have those meetings. So just quickly to review before we wrap up here, um, the nine habits are looking away from the screen every 20 minutes, taking a tech-free day once a month, sleeping screen-free every night, getting up and moving once an hour, that you're on a screen, sharing a family meal every day if possible, playing outside every day if possible, turning off screens one to two hours before bed, no devices at meals, use the gadget basket, to put your dorgans in. Am I disrespectful to call my phone a digital organ or a dorgan? Because that's what I call it. And then uh, read a book. Anyway, it's it, it the the, the courses talk about all the benefits of it. So that's the, that's the scoop with those mini courses. Um, so I'd say, let's stay in touch. If you wanna ask me any questions, there's my email. Go ahead and look at the, uh, uh, look at the book. And I thank you very much for being here. And I think we're about out of time. So I appreciate all of your time spending with me and um, maybe we'll connect in the future. Bri, thank you too. Yep. And we've shared some links in the chat. So feel free to uh, click into that before you log off and you can check out uh, Durable Human, uh, Durable Family Pledge, uh, the manifesto, as Jennifer said, how to be a durable human, uh, the look away mini course, a link to Jennifer's TED talk, uh, and uh, my website, brianymad.com. <laughs> shameless, shame, shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> my man, Bri. Wonderful. Okay, everybody. And I just want to say, be durable. You can do this thing. And, you know, and, and thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. And thanks for the props, too. I'm very happy that you're here. <laughs>